I've known Barry for almost 50 years now. Um, I was very young, Barry was younger than he is now. We were travelling across to the State Bank rerun in, in South Australia and we pulled into a, uh, um, a bakery in Hay to get some morning tea or lunch or something in between. And who should be there but Barry Ferguson and his long-time navigator, Dave Johnson. And what are they doing? They're having coffee and tea and custard tarts. I didn't realise that there was any special significance about this, but um, Barry apparently is known um, pretty well all over Australia as being the person who knows where the best bakeries and best uh, custard tarts are. Anyway, we, uh, we wandered on into, uh, into uh, where was it, Graham? Where it started? Where it started, uh, Nerepa. Nerepa, yes. So anyway, we went there and uh, did the State Bank rerun, um, organised by the HRA and directed by our own Graham Wallace. Um, and I think that, I suspect that was the last rally that Barry actually did as a competitor, uh, the 2015 State Bank. Again, navigated by his long-term uh, friend um, and navigator, Dave Johnson. And, um, I think they had a, had a great time there and uh, we certainly did in another wonderful HRA event. Um, Barry has organised rallies, he's directed them, he's done circuit racing, uh, he's done virtually every significant rally in Australia um, and some overseas um, and he's uh, always sort of bounced back for more. Um, I didn't realise it until I was listening to him a week and a half ago at the London Sydney Marathon reunion that he'd actually raced at Bathurst and won his class. But not only had he raced there um, at Bathurst, he'd, he'd raced there 10 years. So in other words, uh, I, there was a lot of Barry's history that I don't know. Um, then he went on and uh, went rallying and during the 60s and I guess early 70s, he won the New South Wales Rally Championship 10 times. Um, he won the Southern Cross twice. And four times he came second in the Southern Cross, all to Andrew Cowan. So effectively, if Andrew hadn't come out here, Barry would have won the Southern Cross six times. <laughs> um, so, and, and Barry's done safari rallies. Um, you know, it, it just, he's been everything, been in everything bar a shit sandwich, I think. <laughs> Any, anyway. Uh, Barry's driven for the state distributor for Volkswagen, uh, Lamont Motors, I think it was. He's driven for Holden Dealer team in Piranhas, in Monaros, in Commodores. Um, he's driven for Mitsubishi in just about every product they make, except for the Colt Fastbacks. Um, and he's done safari rallies in Pajiros or something like that. Um, but he, he, he's always brought the cars home. Um, he's probably the easiest guy I've ever encountered or ever seen on his machinery. Um, and to we, um, in 1971, I bought a 350 Monaro from the Holden dealer team, which was Barry's car from the 1970 Ambo Round Australia trial. Um, and the only mark that was on the car was where the, the towers on the front suspension thing that you mechanical people will understand. Um, and because one of these towers broke and collapsed on it. Um, but Harry first had said, no, we don't need to worry about doing it on Barry's car because he doesn't break it. <laughs> anyway, after 16,000 kilometres, it did break, sort of only 1,000 before the finish. Um, so Barry's been with all these, these uh, wonderful um, factories that have come out here and participated. Um, He's also the Vice President of the Historic Rally Club of New South Wales and ACT. Um, and only a matter of 10 days ago, he was restored life membership of the club. Which, you know, for 60 years of competing in motorsport and rallying, um, that's well and truly understandable. And on top of that, he's a wonderful gentleman. He's always smiling. And so I'd like to introduce you to one of our living legends, Barry Ferguson.
Thanks, Mike. <coughs> well, thanks for having me down. Uh, Kate has been trying for quite a while to get me to come south, and I eventually uh, made it, because we have, starting on Thursday, this uh, partial rerun of the 68 London to Sydney from Wangaratta, retracing the course all the way through to Warwick Farm. Uh, I can't be sort of here and get back in time to do that, but I've made a commitment. And having done that course uh, once in 68 and in the dark, and once in daylight some 10 years later in the daylight, I don't want to go again, thanks. <laughs> the daylight, I said to myself, how can this block of flats called a Holden Monaro fit down this track? We did. And I'm glad I couldn't see what was over the edge that didn't have a safety fence. It was a long way down. And I think we've got a few people from here tonight who are going up uh, to Wangaratta tomorrow. And they'll see, if they haven't already been on that piece of road, it's a shire road or a council road, uh, Graham? Yeah, it's an eye-opener. It's an eye-opener. Right. I've always liked uh, long-distance events. I've got a Scottish background. Uh, both of our families also came off the land, so I sort of came up with mechanical devices. But I'm not an engineer. I've got mechanical nous and that's about it. But I like to approach things in a methodical way and think about it. I had to also forsake a few events because wife and family and a future. I worked for 42 years for the Arnott and Nestle organisation and I was fortunate to sort of get in at the right time and grew through the organisation. But I had to think to myself occasionally as the years went by, they were good in the time that they gave me, but I had to miss out on, I couldn't do the national rally championship. That would have required too much time away. What was the, we went to the days of surveying when we got to the national days. I had to forsake uh, two East African safaris, but in the long haul, in the big picture, it was the right thing to do. Um, we brought up three boys, and thanks to Rally Art, they were never naked, because Doug Stewart and the uh, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Cowan organisation had lots of clothes. So three boys were walking adverts for Rally Art. However, enough of that. After the war, which was ending in 1945, eight years later, we had the 1953 Red X trial. And that really set motorsport on its uh, feet. It created memberships of clubs that we've not seen since. And I came from Goulburn, which had a car club. Goulburn then had a population of about 20,000. It ended up having the biggest membership of any car club in New South Wales because of the rally country and the rally enthusiasts. My first opportunity was to go uh, in a, I remember it quite clearly, a 1951 Citroen Light 15, two-tone grey, registration number AAA146. <laughs> Why do I remember trivia? I have no idea. <laughs> I was a gate opener. So that was a three-man crew. And what I'm trying to do tonight is uh, give you an insight into how things evolved in New South Wales, which might be very similar to down here, with you know, the odd deviation. I think you, in the early days in particular, were heavy on navigation. We were heavy on navigation for a while, and then uh, I think I was uh, instrumental in dragging us away from that in about 1965, but we'll come to that. With the Scottish background, I thought, with the effort that you put into uh, cars and into the motorsport, I've got to get a return for my time and my effort, because it was all my money originally. So I liked long distance. So I didn't go sprint racing. I got into, well, I did 10 years at Bathurst in, uh, from 63 onwards, when uh, the Phillip Island event moved into New South Wales for the first time. I did uh, six hours at Sandown a few times. We did the 12 hours at Surface Paradise, all long distance. And that's why rallies really appealed to me. They were long, long and long. And they were to the point of four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, you would start and about 10 a.m. the next morning, you would stop having done in miles, old speak, five to 600 miles nonstop. I did my gate opening. Then I did some navigating, and I wasn't very good at that, and I didn't like it, because our navigating system was probably 
uh, a bit easier than yours in that it was more map reference in those days, goes through this point and this point and this point. So they'd count you down. Why they ever counted us down, I'll never know. It was the old four, three, two, one, go. And you go, yep, and stop. And the navigator would get the protractor out and fiddle around. And <laughs> 10 minutes later, you went. And then you went like the absolute clappers. I didn't like that. So after we won the Goulburn 600 uh, uh, mile trial four times in consecutive, consecutively, they banned me from going in it again till I set an event. Now, that was an interesting time because everything is relative to its own period, to its own era. Now, from uh, 53, when the excitement got into the works after the Red X, people started to try and do things to their cars. And basically, we were all running around in stock standard motor cars. I ran around in a Massively powered VW with 36 horsepower. But remember, a Grey Series Holden in those days was about, what, 60 to 65 horsepower? 2.2 litre? We tend to think they were big, beefy engines, but no. So the power to weight ratio, believe it or not, was in favour of the VW Beetle. So we ran them for a long while, stock standard. And the Round Australia trials, basically everything was stock standard. You couldn't buy things off the shelf. I like to approach things methodically, and I don't like walking. I like to start an event, and I like to finish an event, and having, having gotten out on an organised basis, not to debog it or things like that. VWs in the early days, with their swing axle rear suspension, had uh, a horrible habit of popping the rear shock rubbers off the lower point, only because of this backwards and forwards motion that it had. Now, you might say, oh, well, that's okay, everyone had that same problem, and they did. With a, I suppose it was about a one and a half inch flat washer, I was able to stop mine falling apart by just putting this big washer on the outside, everything else was stock standard, and it stopped the shock from detaching itself. Because every time it did, people had to get out and they change the shock. That's time. I ran cross-ply tyres well past when the radials were in and winter treads were in because they had four plies in the sidewalls. So you didn't get punctures and you didn't have to walk. <laughs> we had, as an air-cooled engine, uh, they, in the tight forestry uh, uh, sections where you're sort of revving it to a massive 4,000 revs, they used to get sort of fairly hot. And it took me a little while to wake up to this particular one, but because I had had a couple of old VW mechanics tell me a few little tricks, they said, whenever you've driven it hard, stop, but don't turn the engine off. Make sure that the little green oil light is not even flickering. Just have the revs up at about maybe 900. Don't let that little oil light come on. Let it just progressively cool down. Because I'd observed that with our four o'clock starts, Around about one and two in the morning, well, the hot shots, including Tony Tyler, who came from here, uh, Melbourne, and most of you, or a lot of you would certainly have known him, he was very, very quick. But after about one o'clock in the morning, their performances used to go off. Why? They'd get to a control point, turn the engine off, and the heat sink factor would get in, the tension came out of the rings, the compression went down even lower than it was, and they just didn't perform the way they did. The two old mechanics told me that when the notchback VW came out, it had an annular groove in the oil pressure relief valve, which allowed more oil to pump through. So I put that in. That was about oh, a 10-minute job. It was that easy. And that really even uh, got to the point where I could have turned it off had I so desired. But I'd been so pleased with the way we had succeeded by just sort of you know keeping... Those words of wisdom, don't let that little oil light flicker. Simple things like that. Progressively, and I think it was the uh, rule of the road when you were trialling, as they were then, don't tell anyone that you found out anything about your car to improve it. Keep it close to the chest. So I didn't tell anyone about the washer. I didn't tell anyone about the annular groove. I didn't tell anyone about when they changed the little uh, seat for the front drum brakes for the shoes to sit on, instead of being flat, they angled it. It gave more inertia and they grabbed harder. But in grabbing harder, 
they kept going in straight lines on dirt roads just before corners. So I went back to the flat stock door that you could sort of go in deep because of VW, you had to drive the door handles off it, particularly downhill. You welcomed, you hated uphill, but downhill you let it go for its absolute life and a bit more. And they handled very well. Progressively, uh, the Waggot Head, I'm sure a lot of you, particularly if you're a Holden fan, would have heard of the Waggots, the Waggot Head, Triple Weber Carburetors. The Holden boys were becoming a, a real threat. So I had a phone call. I'm, I was a country rep for Arnott's, so I had a lot of opportunity for running around on dirt roads at the company's expense. And I used to take the VW when it was wet or snowy. I decided that uh, I needed a bit more power. Anyhow, I got this phone call from Lanark Motors in Sydney and Bruce Fraser, who was the director in charge of finance, and he put the money up for the, uh, the cars that we ran, he said, uh, next time you're down in uh, Sydney for a meeting, give me some time. I need a couple of, a couple of hours. So I, and the, I suppose two months later, I get down there and he took me to the workshop and he showed me these crates of industrial engines that had just come in for Pioneer Concrete. They were converting them to run the uh, barrels on your standard concrete mixer. It was a 1500cc Beetle engine and we'd been running what was available to the public, 1200cc and 36 horsepower. 1500cc, yes, 1500cc, changed the magneto, changed the muffler, went straight in the back and away we went. So that was a good lift for us, well and truly. So much so, it coincided with the point that I mentioned earlier, I couldn't run in another Goldman 600 till I directed one. So I said, right, now's my chance. So there was no, you know, four, five, nine, three, six, one, four, six, you know, plot that point and then the next one, the next one, it was all root chart. And, I had a Mark I GT Cortina from the Ford dealer, went out and surveyed the course, came back, and I didn't set the times on the kitchen table. We got the 1500cc Beetle out, and away we went and did actual times. The Garrard brothers, who were very successful in New South Wales, in Holdens, um, they were the first car into the control at Peelwood in the middle of the Abercrombie Mountains, about six hours into the event. But they were something like nearly an hour late. And I was, as director, having a panic. I thought, I've, I've lost everyone. So I said to the Garrard boys when they got there, I said, what have I done wrong? And they said, well, no, I don't think you've done anything wrong, but your times are wrong. The times are lousy. We can't get to them. <laughs> I said to myself then, you, Butte, we'll get the championship again this year. <laughs> So having sort of missed two events, one because I directed and another, we went out and blitzed the field with this little single carburetor, 1500cc. We were then up to 50 horsepower. So we're really making tracks. The factory was down here in Clayton and there was a Gestapo officer by the name of Uli Jakobasa who was the representative out from Germany and he ran it by the book and he wouldn't spend money on motorsport. But we worked on him over a period of time, so much so that during, I think, mid-1966, he asked uh, Wolfsburg if they would let some money uh, loose out of the uh, coffers and build here in Clayton four special rally cars. So they only ever did four of these. It was called, uh, it was a Beetle, a 1967 Beetle, a 1600 TS. Now, it ended up being... A lot of people said, ah, it's a Porsche engine. No way. It was all VW stuff. It was a 1600cc engine, twin carburetor, a special exhaust done by um, Jack Meyer, um, a, uh, an ex-factory mechanic from Germany who was at Worrells of Tourac, the Mercedes dealer. He did the engine. And we had 100 horsepower then in the same 14.400 weight that we always had. So you can see the power to weight ratio was going up and up and up. Not only that, disc brakes, 12 volt electrics, a limited slip diff. The limited slip diff came out of the country buggy that VW marketed for a while, so that was okay. Everything else was stock standard out of the parts bin. 
but they didn't have 12 volts for the VWs until 1968. But a chap who I became friendly with in Newcastle, where I was posted with Arnott's, in 19, the 14th of February 1966, decimal day. Yes, <laughs> I got to, to know this family, and uh, Ron Thompson, one of the brothers, was an electrician. And he said, I can fix your problem that you have and any other VW, but I won't tell anyone. That was the code again, tell nothing. I can make a 12 volt. So he did. Because we would get to, uh, if you ever saw any pictures of my VWs in the early days, they had one driving light. It couldn't run two. It would run two for about three hours, and then you'd turn everything off, and then you'd go to start it, and it would go, rah, rah, and you'd have to be pushed. 12 volts, you'd just look at the key, and then you started because he put the 12 volts through the 6 volt starter. And an ad for Bosch, it was Bosch equipment, he pulled them apart after every event and said after a while, we'll not bother to look at these again. He said, there's less wear than when they were 6 volt. It started, we had lights for the first time ever, not just 30 watt headlamp globes and a Lucas flamethrower or a Marshall, we had courtesy of the REF at Williamtown in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, just out of Newcastle. We had aircraft landing lights in a Ren Raid case that was on the back of a tractor and they were about uh, five inches in diameter. It was just like daylight. We told no one what we had done. We just appeared <laughs> with these two little black lights on the front of the car, black cases. And we only turned them on, the lights, when we were out of a control. We'd go out with the 30 watts blazing, may I use that word, ahead. <laughs> and then once we were sort of out of the side of the control and other competitors, we'd hit the switch and then the world was revealed in front of us. So once again, we could see. We uh, then had uh, the 67 Southern Cross, the second of the uh, Southern Crosses, and BMC sent the works team out. We ended up winning the event and that was in the factory car made from down here and just evolved as we went through those formative years. The Red X trial had done a, a hell of a lot for a sport. It put a lot in and the chap who was behind it was Red Shepherd, a, a, an Englishman who came out here and he had the Red X franchise and he wanted to publicise it in Australia. So he thought of this idea a big event in a big country will go all the way around Australia. So the Australian Sporting Car Club was brought on board to uh, direct the event, which they did very well. Now that uh, Red Shepherd was the father of George Shepherd, who would be known to a lot of you, who masterminded the two big wins in round Australia's for General Motors in Commodores. The two sons that uh, um, George had, we quite often see them at our place, even though they live in Queensland, because those two boys and my three boys went to the same school. Now, this was just all coincidental the way that worked. And we ended up, uh, yes, I have to get the sequence right on some of these things. I tend to wander off sometimes. I'm trying to be chronological and touch on the more interesting aspects. So I think we'll sort of put the VW to one side now. But in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Reddick side of it and the way it evolved, we made a reasonable reputation for ourselves. And uh, Harry Firth, who I'd known sort of quite well for a number of years because he came to a lot of the New South Wales events and did very well. And he won the very first uh, Southern Cross rally. Talk about Victorians coming to New South Wales and winning. They still do it. <laughs> we um, uh, we're invited uh, from him. No, I've got my timings wrong. 68 was the first time I did Holden for the, yes, for the London to Sydney. 69, Harry said, you better drive one of our Monaros in the various events. Then in 70, we had the six cylinder Tirana and we ran under Holden Dealer Team banner for that. Now, doing that sequence, uh, we had the 68 London Sydney. How am I going for time? Yeah, you've got plenty of time. All right. The 68 London Sydney, the first time I drove, the, we had three cars prepared by David Mackay and he didn't ever get his hands dirty but he had the money from the newspapers, from the Daily Telegraph in particular here in Sydney and from Castrol. 
had the cars prepared, freighted to London for the 10,000 miles in 10 days, miles I'm using, 10 days from London to Sydney. London to Bombay, 7,000 miles. Crossing the Chusan to a Fremantle, then 3,000 across Australia. The first dirt that we drove the car on was the first dirt section in the event. No previous experience in the car, no input into it whatsoever, but he had uh, his own ideas. And if you knew David Mackay, your ideas were his ideas. He just he would just forget that you were even there and just ram things through and you could go away and do them. So the cars were good, but they weren't quite good enough. Had we not had some of the problems that we had, we still wouldn't have beaten the Fords. The Falcons were just far superior because they'd been prepared by someone who knew rally cars well and truly. We all know that old Harry wasn't called the Fox for any particular reason other than he could foxily do all sorts of interesting things. They would have legitimately beaten us had we had full noise. The biggest problem that we had was a real eye-opener in many ways. We were doing the section uh, Sivas to Erzincan in Turkey. That was about, uh, I think it was 110 or 115 miles. And it was beautiful. It suited the Monaro. It was hard-packed dirt. It was wide, and the Monaro needed wide roads. So we were thundering through this service to Erzincan and having a great time. And we were conscious of a pair of lights just slowly hauling us in. So we're on this particular, we're supposed to be about three quarters of the way through this 100, we're toward 110 mile section. And I'm braking heavily for this right angle left hander that's coming up. And these lights have caught up to us. While I've got the nose of the car buried in the ground, this Mark II Lotus Cortina goes past, still on the throttle, and then we could hear the change in the exhaust note. He's now uh, from here to the camera away, and he threw it sideways so we could see our lights on the side of his white Mark II Lotus Cortina. So he'd done, done the old flick, slid, and he's gone. And we sort of got there in the old Monaro and lumbered around. At the next corner, I put my foot on the brake, and it accelerated madly, although the pedal had gone to the floor and nothing was happening in the retar retardation. It just psychologically was going much faster. The brakes had fallen apart on the left-hand rear. Drum brakes couldn't stand the racket of two and a half tonnes being driven hard and fast. So we carried on in the section into uh, Erzincan to a little service station. And my co-driver was Doug Shivers, who was a good rally race driver from New South Wales, but a good engineer as well. And he said, we hadn't uh, stopped, we just sort of kept going. We knew what the problem was, there's something gone wrong with the brakes. We didn't know what, which wheel or was it the master cylinder or whatever. But Doug got out very quickly and he said, I think the way the car's been behaving, it'll be the left hand rear. Pulled the wheel off, pulled the drum off, and this little p pyramid of metal pieces just piled up on the ground. <laughs> And there was a stub axle sticking out of the plate. There was nothing else there. It had gone. So he said, we need a ball bearing. We need a ball bearing. Yes, I can block the line off and we'll have maybe three wheel brakes, maybe two wheel brakes, but we'll have something. Dave had a Turkish English dictionary. So he got this out and he's going through ball and bearing and fumbling. And this little Turk was there in a World War I, it smelt like it, World War I great coat. And he put his hand in his pocket and he had a handful of ball bearings. <laughs> Doug Shivers took three of different sizes, found the right one, plugged it, and away we went. We didn't have any breaks of any consequence till we got back to Australia. And then we had uh, GM, we're not sponsoring motorsport, they were not spending any money on us, it was no GM money whatsoever, no support. But they got all enthused because even with our dramas, I think we were then in 12th place. Yes, 12th place. And they thought, right, we better, oh yes, these Fords are doing fairly well. We better get a bit of effort in. So they changed the whole rear axle rather than just do the brakes. That was to be our downfall later. Coming across Australia, we're heading into uh, Broken, we're on the way to Broken Hill from Lake King. We had a uh, control at Mingeri, which was just out of Broken Hill. And about halfway across, 
Dave sitting in the back having his uh, rest period, Dave Johnson, the navigator, and he said, I think we've got a problem here. The left-hand rear tyre seems to pop out and pop back, pop out and pop back. What had happened, the rear axle they had put in was absolutely stock standard, no modifications whatsoever, and the shrink ring had let go. <coughs> so the axle was moving out and back. So we had ascertained this by jacking it up and fiddling around, and Shivo, getting his mechanical now, again said, what we've got to do here is, we've got to drive as fast as we can and be gentle on the car, and we go hard around right-handers, because it was left-hand rear, so that'll push the axle back in, and we'll be gentle when we're going around left-handers. <laughs> right. It still cost us 47 minutes. But going back a little, as I was in Newcastle on the 14th of February 1966 and met the Thompson family, Ron, who was the electrician, had said, we used to go for a drink at the Cross Keys Hotel at Tyres Hill. So we had a celebratory seven or eight drinks, and he said, a mate and I will see you when you need us. We're coming to see the London Sydney through Australia. We don't know where we're going, but when you need us, we'll be there. We got into uh, Mingary, and uh, there at the, we came down this road, a left-hander across a little bridge and up to a rise on the top is a white Holden used C.W. Thompson Mayfield, which is Newcastle, Holden service. He'd been coming out, he called into the Holden dealer in Broken Hill to ask uh, where are the rally cars coming through. And the bloke said, well, well, look, we're just getting this diff out to put into Barry Ferguson's car out at Mingary. Um, follow us. Ron didn't follow. He took over. He was a big, burly bloke and a good mechanic. Whole rear axle into the back of the, uh, his ute out there. He had organised some 44-gallon drums and about uh, eight bushes just lifted it. Two and a half tonne now, half on the drums. That's a fair old feat for a Holden Monaro, isn't it? <laughs> Changed it, I think it, the whole exercise took about 20 minutes and changed it, and away we went. That, of course, had been our demise. But in but it, uh, tooth, I can get one of my favourite stories in here in a minute. Coming in and limping along, we uh, had time to sort of think of lots of things, and we knew we had to be sort of very careful once we got the axle in to... Oh, we were, yeah, what are we going to do? Kernamona Homestead, we were going to have a, uh, a uh, I think it was a refreshment break at the homestead. And that was a big spread on, near the border. It was run by uh, a couple, uh, Aileen Morehouse, that was the lady. She was more the manager of this massive property than was her husband, and a real old style bush character. She uh, came across because she was a bit of a Holden fan and she says, oh, well, how are you going? And oh, we told her, oh, oh that's no good. And uh, we've just got to get ourselves in. And, uh, we're going to Broken Hill and see if we can go to the Holden dealer. And she says, no, 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 you won't do that at all. See that? Oh, there were Ford flags and Ford cars everywhere because Ford had a massive following. I think they had engineers from Germany for the Ford Taurus, from England for the uh, Cortinas and from Australia for the, the Falcons. Holden, nothing in sight. However, the police car was a Holden. <laughs> and old, old Amy rushed up to the sergeant, told him the story, and he says, right, what we'll do here is you get on the pedal radio, we'll get through the cop shop in Broken Hill, we'll dispatch an officer down to the dealer and get the dealer to you know, see what he can do. Has he got an axle? He had an axle, right? It was in a... Um, I think it was a statesman sitting on the floor. So <laughs> they just jacked it up and Ron arrived. And that's the story of Ron and the axle and us sort of being able to get to the finish. After that, tell me when I've got to stop or slow down. <laughs> that was 68. I drove one of Harry's cars in 69. We got third in the Southern Cross. And then Holden, uh, through Harry, had the Tirana. That was 1970. Wow, what a little rocket ship that was in a straight line. We got the car in February and it didn't handle until September of that year. <laughs> if you went around the same corner six times at the same speed, it would do six different things. 
and the next time you did it, it would be another sequence. It handled like, it didn't handle like anything. <laughs> so every time we sort of had finished an event, the car would come back to uh, Harry's H&N Firth workshop and they'd fiddle around and fiddle around and fiddle around and we'd get the car back for the next New South Wales event. For the MG Newcastle 500 miler of that year, which was September, yes, September, it handled. It was unbelievable. The contrast was black to white. It was magnificent. I mean, it had all the power. It would go well in a straight line, but at last it handled properly and he got a bit more suspension travel into it because that was sort of very short. So we won that event and we went on to win the Southern Cross Rally of 1970. And then they decided they were going to put a bit more into racing. And Doug Stewart had got money from Japan and they wanted to have a full-on works effort in Australia for Mitsubishi. And they would, and Dita would probably know a lot of this story. Um, the first one that came out was a Galant. They'd been playing around with Colts, but then came the Galants. And that was, I still liked the Galant more than the, the Lancer that was the, the real rally car. We got uh, third in that one, and then we got the Lancers. Well, in the years that the Lancer was here, if the podium finish for the Southern Cross is three, that's one, two, three, and I think it was five years of Lancer, that's five, three is a 15, 15 positions. 80% of those 15 positions were Lancer over those five years. It just obliterated everything. Andrew came out. <coughs> I wish he hadn't. <laughs> he, he kept winning and we got second. Uh, the cars were very, very good. There's no doubt in the world about that. But they are very clever, these uh, Japanese. I've always taken my hat off to them. Thinkers, planners, and we must win. The cars came out originally for us to try, and they are the bee's knees, the little Japanese crew said, ready to rally. So Doug took us away to Braidwood and District, which is good rally country in New South Wales, and we tested the cars and sent the four cars back and I think about three fool's cap pages of things to change, which they did. And Andrew Cowan went to the factory and he and Doug worked with the engineers and sorted out the gear ratios to a better set of close ratios. And the uh, little uh, Japanese people were just amazed at what they were learning. And then they ended up with a good system whereby to get the workers enthused, uh, they had competitions. And if you won your section during the year, you would be elected to go along and be part of the team, part of the service team. But it had one flaw to it. They were specialists. So you'd come into control and you might have been having a bit of a, a light problem. And the little man would say, no, 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 I chassis, I chassis. Light, power, you go next control. <laughs> ah, that, that was the, the weak point. But fortunately, the cars were good. We had two trips back to Japan all expenses paid, of course. And we went to the factory that produced the Lancers. And I don't think I've ever seen this before, and we probably never will again. They closed the plant for half a day. Every worker, and I think there was something like uh, 15, 1,600 of them, were assembled on the, uh, the front lawn. They all had their little caps on, they all had their white gloves on, and they all appeared to be listening. They were looking at us. In Australia, they lay on the grass and they look around, they fall asleep. These people were just so thrilled at what they had been able to do. And that car, uh, well, they still are in the museums there. Uh, Nissan followed suit and they did a similar thing. Hence, you had the great battles between the two of them. I think that could be a point five to go. Okay. Um, so that was that. We had the... 1970, London to Sydney, nowhere good as, sorry, 1977, London to Sydney, the second of the competitive events. Um, the Citroen that Jim Reddyx and Doug Stewart and I had was a uh, five-speed manual CX2400. It was not the D-series, that avant-garde shape. It was the next more sane looking, looked like a motor car. Still with its uh, hydroelastic, not hydroelastic, hydro pneumatic suspension, that's right. One of the uh, many, many things happened there. But one thing that I really enjoyed was, um, number one was, 
we had torn, it was front wheel drive, we had torn an axle boot on the right hand front. And we had to keep stopping every now and again and Jim would jam more grease into the remains of the boot to keep the thing from exploding. We had a service crew met us in Alice Springs, we changed the boot and we then averaged uh, for the next four and a half hours over 100 miles an hour in this Citroen. Once you wound it up, it went. Jim sat in, Jim was a co-driver, um, Doug Stewart was doing a lot of the navigating and driving, so we're sharing the driving, but uh, Jim was in the front and he said, right, all bitumen until you turn to the west to go across the Rabbit Flat. So we're rocketing up the bitumen and they have spoon drains in the bitumen just every now and again. So we'd call it, all eyes were just like plates looking ahead. And Jim would then, as soon as we called a spoon drain or a culvert or whatever, Jim would just sort of pull the lever between the two front seats, up the suspension would raise, <laughs> and which could just go straight through at a million miles, well it felt like a million miles an hour. And then he'd put the lever down and down she'd settle again. That allowed us to do, for that four and a half hours, over a hundred miles an hour. What an amazing old motor car. After that, uh, we, went, uh, we went careering around in the safaris uh, from Sydney to Darwin, four-wheel driving, and that was uh, a whole new world. We, uh, 85 was the first event. I joined them in 86. I think I ran for 10 years in, in that one. And I hadn't uh, had any experience in four-wheel drive. And we had in the 86 car, it was a little short chassis uh, Pajero in the marathon class, and we ended up getting third outright. But we came through our first, what I learnt was, a jump up. Now, who knows what a jump up is? <laughs> a jump up is the thing that when you don't know what it is, you come and you stop. And you say, are we on the right road? No tracks, no cars, we haven't seen one going any, any which way. How do you get up these things? And we eventually decided, well, no one's turned back, there must be a way through. You put it into low, low, you put it into, no, you put it into low of the four-wheel drive range, then you put it into first gear, and you just let it walk its way up the, up the steps. I said, no, 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 we're not going to be able to get up there. It just quietly walked up the steps as a staircase, chopped into the rocks. I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Andrew Cowan came out and did a, his usual thing and kept winning things, so that was okay. And then he conned me some two or three years later and he said, look, um, how about I give you a chance to have a new navigator who's had four or five years experience in the Dakar. He's driven Mitsubishi four or five times and he's a film star and there'll be a film crew. He's a multi-millionaire, he's contributing to the event and I think you'll find that he'll be a worthwhile asset. Okay, righto. He was a worthwhile asset, all right. I subsequently learnt he'd been in the uh, Dakar four or five times, had not finished one, <laughs> had crashed in each event. I got very nervous the first time I let him do a, a stint on a, a, a transport stage, and I tried to help him and teach him. So on the next transport stage, he's putting these new things into practice. And a long sweeping right-hander, very gentle. It got a bit out of uh, shape. So he took his hands off the wheel and jumped on the brake. And we rolled down the road four times. Oh, we finished, we finished. When it, it spoke little English. When it got back on its wheels, fortunately it landed on its wheels, he clearly enunciated two words. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That might be a good note to end on. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, well, let's see what I forgot. That's all right. Gary, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to uh, call to the floor to see if anyone's got a couple of questions or anecdotes that they'd like to um, pass on. Graham? Just haven't mentioned the Repco. Oh, we hear so much about the Repco. <laughs> What can I say about the Repco? Any questions from the Repco? Everyone knows the result. The longest, hardest round Australia trial that there ever was. Of the 160 odd cars that started, something like that, only 11 cars actually did every millimetre of the course. 
I think 80 finished, but cut and run, cut and run, cut and run. Uh, I had the good fortune to uh, have one of the cars. Uh, Peter Brock had the team car, the lead car, and Shaker Mater and Rano Elton had the third car. Uh, engineered uh, in New South Wales by George Shepherd, this George Shepherd who was Red Shepherd's son, so this, the tradition for long distance events was still there, but he's a manager and is an organiser, he's a preparer. And he'd spent a period of time uh, with Harry at the Holden dealer operation and uh, got a few clues of Harry's, but George was no slouch. He, he had a very, and has, a very good brain. Uh, the cars were very, very reliable. They were not as fast as the Ford Cortinas that Colin Bond had put together. They were little projectiles. And even though the Commodores had the you know, XU1 Tirana motors, they had the uh, Bathurst M21 gearboxes, locker diffs, beautiful suspension, had everything. They still were no match in outright performance to the Commodores, uh, to the uh, Cortinas. But fortunately, the Cortinas had a few problems, like Bondi rolled his once, uh, they broke engine mounts, uh, they put rocks through the sump, they did all sorts of things that you don't like to have happen to a rally car. But once they got Greg cars, of the three cars, they pinched pieces off the other two, they got his fairly right for Townsville. From Townsville to Melbourne, he just cleared out. Had that been the event, he would have won it. He was just so much better than any other car. So the cars were good, but they just weren't holding together. Our cars, uh, there were a lot of uh, things in the papers in particular about the front suspension. The front suspension was being renewed on a regular basis. Not quite right. I think it's called the gland nut on the pogo stick used to keep working loose. And the mechs that were with us decided the quickest way to tighten those nuts up was to put another pogo stick in, and then during their leisure time, tighten that nut up, and then the next time it happened, because it kept happening, um, just change the pogo sticks. So we had the same number of pogo sticks rotating through the three cars. Uh, we had preparatory uh, preparation, not preparation, uh, uh, care for the long distance haul with a, uh, putting rear axles into them in, I think that could have been broom, a few things like that. Um, I've got that car. <clears throat> I bought it some years later, which if I've got another additional two minutes, I have three sons. Three sons don't listen to their father very much at all. So the eldest one had just sold a, a very competitive little uh, Japanese ZZR Isuzu rally car to a chap in Bathurst. And the young chap rang back and said to Peter, have you got any you know, invoices and records of things that you did to it? And Peter says, yes, of course I have. I'll send them to you. So he's rummaging through and he finds this chap's name and phone number. And we had met that, this bloke who had bought the car from General Motors and he had our second place car. And Peter said, uh, oh, I've got the number of the bloke. Remember our Commodore? I said, yes, I haven't seen that in years. He said, uh, I wonder if should, I should give the number a ring. And I said, Peter, Roger died 15, 16, 17 years ago. Unless you've got a diversion to hell and heaven, you won't get him. <laughs> like a good son, the next weekend, he's on the phone. He says, Dad, get in your car. In 20 minutes' time, I want you out at Riverston, which is about 20 minutes from our place. I walked down the side of this... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. This bloke was an engineer, a one-man band, who never threw anything away. He had sheds everywhere. He had metal and trucks and wheels, and I don't know what he didn't have. Now, around the back, and there around the back, away from any building, any tree, a concrete pad, up on stands, was the Commodore. The paint had gone to God, completely and utterly, but the car was otherwise totally intact without a skerrick of rust in it. When they stripped it back to paint it, nothing had rusted. And the VB, VC Commodores have got a weakness in the sill panel. Because it was up in the air for so long, for 17 years, it had just quietly tried to die. We put it onto a trailer, did some negotiations with the old uh, girl who had moved away when the husband died, 
and this was a friend of the family, and she says, I'll give you a ring in three months when we settle down after Roger's death. With the phone call from Peter 17 years later, she said, oh, they're meaning to do something about that. <laughs> so we negotiated, we got it, we had it all over Sydney in pieces and uh, put it back together and we've done most of your events in those early days, the rerun things. Did a lot of work in it and it's still running and it still hasn't fallen apart. Oh, that's diverting a little bit, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's going post. What happened during? Uh, did anything untoward happen during? Not really. We were just... <laughs> we just had a very... Uh, what would I say? Hard four weeks holiday driving around Australia. Was it how, how long was it? It was two weeks. It was a, felt like four. <laughs> <laughs> The final thing, the, um, we thought we might get a car in the top half dozen. When we got to Townsville with one, two and three, the heavies from General Motors flew up and got all very interested in what was sort of going on and said to us, don't race each other, look after these cars. This is the greatest bit of publicity we can ever have and it's the first time that General Motors America officially sanctioned motorsport. So they got a good return. I was recently made aware of circumstances surrounding one of your public cross events, whereby you commenced the event with only one set of tyres. Uh, maybe it was to do with the budget. Your service crew was made up of one mechanic and many enthusiasts. And they worked out that when Rano, who was replacing his tyres regularly, um, would throw away his old worn treads, that your enthusiasts would come along and pick up those tyres and service your needs perfectly. You proceeded to set four fastest times, which surprised the professor to the point that he approached you afterwards and asked, what tyres are you using? <laughs> and you responded, the same as you run. <laughs> By the way, I spoke to Peter Jansen earlier in the day. Um, if anybody has any other last questions, um, otherwise hold your peace. Um, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to thank you, Barry. It's been a wonderful journey and uh, I'd also like to thank both Alan and Graham for helping get you here. It's been terrific. And uh, I'd like to make a small presentation to you. Um, you're not aware, or maybe you are, but we've got a bit of a tradition in the club. Um, we have uh, a wonderful gnome maker down here. And Amy, would you like to come up here just for a moment <coughs> and uh, make a special presentation? <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the fun jobs I get every now and then is to try and translate the colour scheme of a car onto a gnome. <laughs> you should try it sometime. Um, and it's even more difficult when it's a small gnome. So anyway, I've done my best and I'd like to present this to Barry. No, you can name him, her, her. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll come up with something. Car 17 on the hat, HDT Marlboro on the jacket. Really well done. Thank you, Andy.